church or anything, but I just want to first give honor to God, the beneficent and the merciful one, the one God to whom praise is due forever. I can feel the spirit of Malcolm X uh, in this place, and it's certainly a, a humbling experience uh, to, to be here in this place, particularly after uh, reading about the Hotel Teresa, uh, that Fidel Castro stayed here uh, rather than staying uh, downtown, that many of the things that Malcolm X was involved with and was dealing with uh, was right here, and Adam Clayton Powell and other people. So uh, I just feel like I'm, uh, I'm standing on, on holy ground, and I'm very happy to be here with you uh, in, in this very, to me, a very sacred place and a very sacred space. Uh, and so I, I just want to uh, say that before I, I, uh, I say anything else. I, I want to thank all of the sponsors uh, of this event uh, and the organizers of this event uh, who, uh, who pulled it together, who thought it out, and who see that, uh, that there's something uh, on the agenda that needs to be dealt with, such as uh, the things that are being uh, discussed and uh, suggested by the provocative title uh, of this evening, uh, which I think is uh, what's human rights got to do with it. It sounds like there's a little bit of a Tina Turner uh, influence on that, but that's cool. I'm uh, from down with that too. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like what's love got to do with it. it. Love has got something to do with it, and human rights has got something to do with it too. So I'm just honored to be here and to, uh, to be a part of what you're trying to do. I, um, <clears throat> I just want to, uh, to start out by, uh, by giving you a uh, a little bit of a, a, a brain teaser that we always do with the People's Institute uh, just, to, uh, just to get things going here and then I'm going to use that as my, uh, my launching off point for talking about uh, how uh, we must begin to uh, think about applying a, um, a, a human rights framework to the, uh, to the work that we do uh, on the Rockefeller drug laws, their repeal and their uh, abolition and also other things that we might be involved with. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to ask you to put nine dots on a piece of paper in this configuration right here. And I'd like for you to connect all nine dots using four straight lines without lifting your pen or pencil from the paper. I'll repeat this several times. Connect all nine dots using four straight lines without lifting your pen or pencil from the paper. How many of you have seen this exercise here? Okay, how many of you can do it? Fewer people. All right, well, uh, we'll try it anyway. See if you can do it. Don't be uh, afraid to make a mistake. You probably will, but uh, uh, go ahead, and uh, we won't tell the people at Columbia <laughs> that, you, that you messed up on this very simple, simple exercise. Okay, uh, young lady, since uh, I can, I'm looking on your paper, it looks like you got it, and I'm going to interrupt your meal and, okay. and ask you to go ahead and uh, help us uh, and show us what you've come up with. Because I, you have some pretty good glasses here, I can see her paper. Thank you. What's your name? Natanya. Natanya. Let's give Natanya a hand. <laughs> no money wasted on her education, huh? Okay. Okay, so now um, some of you came up with a different answer uh, than Natanya, and I'm looking on some of these papers around here, and, uh, and uh, what, did, what was Natanya's approach that was different than uh, it looks like many people's approaches around the, uh, the room? What's, what's the difference? Yes, ma'am. So well, the analogy is that you're supposed to think outside the box. Obviously, our idea would be immediately to start with the box inside. However, she decided that in reality to focus on the question and answer it in a different way. And Tanya has been duly analyzed right here. <laughs> so, 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 she, so we, uh, we projected onto this configuration of dots of box. It's just nine dots in, the, in, in rank here, but uh, we, we project onto that a, a box. And uh, 
many people uh, look at this as an example of several things. We look at that as an example of socialization. Socialization, of course, is a highfalutin term for how we're prepared to fit into a group. And as we reflect, we're always prepared to fit into some kind of group throughout our life, whether it's the group that is our family, uh, and we learn how to be a child within that family, the group that is our neighborhood, the group that is our community, the group that is our faith group, the group that is the school uh, cohorts that we go uh, to school with, the group that we graduate uh, with, the group that we work with, the group that we uh, socialize with, they're all these ways that we are socialized to fit into a group. And so then uh, if we want to, uh, to be a part of that, then there are certain ways that we have to act and think. And so here many of us, have, or all of us, have probably been to school in different places and different times, and um, we all came up with the same answer in the same wrong way. Many people came up with a different configuration, but still within a certain limit. Uh, of, the, of this parameter. And what this has to do with what we want to talk about tonight is, is that if we're going to look at the Rockefeller drug laws, if we're going to look at the victims of the Rock Rockefeller drug laws, not only those victims who are incarcerated, but those victims who love those who, incar who are incarcerated, that is the family. Because I would contend that when one person gets locked up, the whole family actually is getting locked up. Because they now uh, are, uh, are tied to the destiny of whatever happens to their loved one there. And any human rights issue that affects an individual who's locked up affects the family of that individual that is locked up. So then we must begin to think outside of the box of, um, of all of that in terms of not just what happens to that individual, but what happens to the family of that individual. Not only what happens to that individual with respect to their civil rights, but what happens to that individual with respect to their human rights? Uh, we know that, uh, that throughout the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, that there was a mighty struggle, some would say a 85% successful struggle for civil rights. And that was the ground uh, that we battled on, and that was the, the right that we battled for. And, uh, and that was something that was worthy of being battled for and should uh, be protected. As we know, those things that we call civil rights are those rights that we derive uh, as a result of being citizens from the United, of the United States, and they're derived from the various uh, amendments and provisions in the U.S. Constitution. So whatever civil rights we have are those civil rights that derive from the Constitution, and the amendments to the Constitution. Obviously, the Constitution wasn't sufficient when they, uh, when they wrote it, and that's why they had to keep on amending it over and over until they got it right. And it might be right now, but they're not applying it right. So here we have a situation where we're looking at how do we begin to think outside of the box, even in terms of how we fight for civil rights. Because since the Reagan years, the ground has shifted in terms of how we fight for civil rights. Prior to uh, the Reagan years, you remember that uh, there were a lot of uh, class action suits, through, particularly in the 1970s, that were successfully won. But when uh, Reagan got into office, they shifted the ground. They changed the rules so that when Reagan got into office, they changed it so that no longer uh, could you look at a class action suit, a charge of institutional racism, systemic racism, or structural racism uh, as a way of saying, well, be based on this effect, this discriminatory effect, this class has been aggrieved, they uh, deserve remedy as a result of these uh, discriminatory practices, they changed it so that now it's no longer dealing with proving effect. It, you have to prove intent. So then they took down the sign that said white only and black only, colored only and white only. Uh, but, the, uh, but now the, the, that, that intent remains, not just in the, uh, in the policies but in the practices. So even though the things that were written into the law might have been changed in terms of 
of, of the, uh, the demise of Jim Crow and segregation, the practices have continued on. As I was talking to Reverend Billings uh, earlier, um, my point as we talk about the Constitution, I'll move on a little bit from that, uh, you'll remember that people of African descent in the U.S. Constitution were designated as how much of a human being? Three-fifths Three of a human being. And this did not change until the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which provided equal protection of the laws. Three-fifths of a human being, that's by the law. We were treated as three-fifths of a human being. We weren't even people. We were chattel property. The Civil War comes and goes. We have the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. And here we have the 14th Amendment, wherein we get the Equal Protection uh, Clause. But my opinion, and this is just my opinion, is that even though the law changed, and they say that uh, in the law, uh, three-fifths uh, is no longer applicable in terms of de jure what is in the law, I would say that, that uh, through the entirety of the United States history, from the signing of the Constitution to this very moment, even though they changed the law, the practices have remained constant throughout. Indeed, black people only have three-fifths of a right to anything that white people have in the United States. So I would say that as we look at the racist effect of the Rockefeller drug laws, we can see the legacy of being treated and being designated as three-fifths of a human being. We're, 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 we deserve three-fifths of the judgment of the justice that other people uh, get. We des deserve three-fifths of the fairness that other people get. We deserve three-fifths of, um, of the equity and equality that other people are, are deserving. So then as we begin to think about how do we fight for the civil rights of people that are obviously being violated under the Rockefeller drug laws, it becomes increasingly difficult to say that as a class of people, we can say that now we, all these people are being messed over, their rights are being violated, but we can't get a class actions, we can't get any fire going, you know, under a class action suit. What are we to do? We need to think outside the box. This is what my point is. We need to begin to think of a point outside of the periphery of the imaginary box wherein we find our constitutional rights uh, confining us now. We know that we are right now uh, in a regime uh, in the United States where the president does not, it not, does not respect the Geneva Convention, does not respect the Constitution of the United States, and does not respect any treaties that the United States has signed on to. We got trouble, my friends, right here in River City with that kind of regime uh, operating and denying us our civil and human rights. And when we think about the human rights regime, they have within the UN, at the international level, they have a different standard for, for proving. They have a different standard for analyzing they have a different standard for adjudicating what might be a violation of one's rights. And they're not concerned as much with intent as results and effect. What are the effects of this law? What are the effects of, um, of these practices? What are the effects of these policies? This is the main thing that we're looking at here at the human rights level. And we've got a little uh, competition from outside and that's all right, too. But uh, we're saying then that we need to be aware not only of the civil rights of the people who are locked up in the Rock Rock Rockefeller drug laws, but we need to be concerned about the human rights of the Rockefeller drug laws uh, in terms of uh, those violations that uh, are, are proceeding from them. Um, I'll share with you a few more comments because we have uh, actually a, an expert in experts on the Rockefeller drug laws, uh, more expert than I here, who are waiting for me to uh, shut up and sit down. And I want to hear what they want to say too, So, uh, but I'm not sitting down yet, so, uh, so we just, uh, just hang on. Okay, so, so I said that the United States has a number of treaties. And what you should know is, is that there's uh, seven treaties um, that are called human rights treaties. 
Some say eight, but I'll say, I'll say seven because that's a nice uh, biblical number there, and I'm, I'm down with those kind of numbers. But we got seven treaties, and only three of those treaties have been ratified by the United States. Seven treaties, three have been ratified. Of a couple of them that have not been ratified, and I'll put the ones that have been ratified up here earlier, a couple of them that you would think the United States would want to be ratifying, but they haven't touched it. There's uh, one that has to do with the rights of the child. You would think that since they're snooping around in your, in your Google searches, in your Yahoo searches, to see if you're trying to, uh, to beam up some kitty porn, this is what they said, this is why they want to violate your, uh, your civil liberties and your, and your privacy uh, to do that. You would think, with that kind of effort being led by Alberto Gonzalez, the head of the Justice Department, that you would think that they would have ratified a treaty that has a specific clause within it that prohibits that kind of action and suggests particular sanctions and remedies when that happens. So the United States has not ratified the, uh, the rights of the child treaty, which many other countries that the United States is always criticizing uh, is, uh, have uh, ratified that treaty. Another treaty uh, that they have not ratified, uh, that I'm talking about Congress now, um, is one called CEDAW, which is the, uh, the covenant to end uh, discrimination against women. You would think, since we have had women be uh, on the, uh, the political ticket of both the, the Democratic and the Republican Party at the highest levels that you could think of in terms of running for office, that women, a woman is now running uh, the House of Representatives, that, that there, there's a woman who might be the next president who comes right here from this area, you would think with all of that woman power that, uh, that there would be at least an effort to ratify a treaty that guarantees that, that discrimination against women uh, is, is ended. And might I say that in both of these treaties that the rights of incarcerated children are included in the c Convention on the Rights of the Child, that the rights of incarcerated women are included uh, in, the, uh, in the one that has to do with, uh, with the discrimination against women. Now, enough of those. Let's look at what the United States has ratified and see what the, uh, what the possibilities are. Okay, well, this is easy. C-A-T. CAT. That's the uh, that's a convention or the covenant against torture. The United States has ratified that. This is the one that they were taking the task uh, about just 12 months ago pertaining to what the practices that were going on at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo. But what you must know about the practices that they were doing at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo, they've been doing in the California penal institutions at the adult and the juvenile level. And when I was in Switzerland last year, there were uh, people who, uh, who came there who found that, uh, that, 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 that many people had been violated and uh, many people had been upset by this as a result of, of torture practices. Another one, CERD, C-E-R-D, CERD. That's a convention to end all forms of racial discrimination. This actually was the first human rights uh, treaty that they ratified in 1963. We know what kind of things were going on in 1963 in this country. Birmingham was going on. The assassination of Dr. King, not Dr. King, but Dr. King's uh, main uh, support in the White House. Uh, that is what was going on. Uh, I think uh, Megar Evers, uh, he got assassinated that year. We know that police dogs were being sicked on, on children and people who were demonstrating for their civil rights that uh, the fire hoses were turned on people because of fighting for their civil rights. And in the midst of all of that, the United Nations put together and, ratify, and the United States ratified this particular treaty that has to do with racial discrimination. And then there's this one, and this is the one that we were in Switzerland last year and here in New York dealing with, uh, the ICCPR, which is the International Covenant on Civil and political rights. This is one that has 26 uh, separate and distinct articles uh, to it, 
and these uh, articles that, uh, that are in, in that particular one actually cover things that are in both CERD and in CAT. That is to say, there are provisions in this one that had to do with racial discrimination, provisions within this one that also had to do with torture too, and also provisions within this one that have to do with the rights of incarcerated <coughs> people. You, are you detecting a, a bit of a theme here in terms of the human rights that we have? So then as, as I summarize this particular point and move on to the other, last night someone asked me when I was speaking at Fordham University, they were asking me, well, what's the difference between civil rights and human rights? And really there are no differences because whatever civil right you have are encompassed in all the human rights that you have. But if you take all of the civil rights that you have and the remedies that are suggested as a result of the violation of those civil rights, and you take the, uh, the, the CAT treaty and the rights that you get for, from that, the CERD treaty and the rights that you get from that, the ICCPR treaty and the rights that you get from that, you actually have more human rights than you have civil rights. But most of us don't know what those rights are. And what I would contend in is if you don't know what your rights are, then you won't know when they're being taken from you. You won't know when they're being violated, and, and even more uh, sadly, you won't even miss them uh, when they're gone because you didn't know what you had uh, when they took it from you. So then this is a very important uh, thing that I think that we need to address, is that as United States citizens, we usually project onto other countries that a civil rights uh, issue is in Bosnia-Herzegovina. A civil rights uh, issue is in Darfur, a civil rights issue is in the Middle East or somewhere in East Timor or somewhere else in Pakistan, etc. And we only see ourselves as being covered by civil rights. But my friends, we're citizens of the world. They always talk about being a part of a global economy and a global uh, community. Well, in that global community, the global community has human rights. So we must welcome ourselves back into the human race and claim and protect our, our human rights. So then a couple of more things uh, that, that I point out, out on this. Uh, <clears throat> that, the, uh, that the Rockefeller drug laws, in my opinion, are, violation, are violating a number of articles of the ICCPR. And what I would say is, is that one of the results of having the Rockefeller drug laws is that people not only get incarcerated, but they get put into positions where they're being tortured, and they're being put into a position where they're, ra where they're being racially discriminated against. So when we look at what's going on right now in your prison system, from the juvenile system to the adult, we must lay a human rights framework over it, the human rights framework of the, of the rights that derive from each of these treaties, and then we must ask, what's human rights got to do with it? If we ask the right questions, my friend, in my opinion, I think that we'll start getting some of the right answers. So then what I'm saying here is, is that we be, need to begin to think outside the box, to, to apply a, a human rights framework to things that we ordinarily only uh, limit to, uh, to those things that we get from being a part of citizens in the United States. So in the ICCPR treaty, there's, for instance, Article 6, which, by the way, is the article called the right to life. This is one of the, uh, the articles that the United Nations, United Nations Human Rights Committee last year found that, um, that in Hurricane Katrina, that the United States had violated uh, the people's right to life because it's a responsibility of a, of a government, as they say, a state government, to protect people to use their institutions and to work, use the infrastructure to protect people because people have the right to life and they have the right to live in a government or in a, in a nation where those rights are protected by the systems and institutions that are sanctioned by the state. And so as we saw the systems overload and systems breakdown as a result of Hurricane Katrina, we saw the people's rights to life were, were desecrated and violated. Indeed, we saw that the United States practiced depraved indifference when it came to the human rights of people in Hurricane Katrina because if they had not uh, done that, if they had seen those people as few, fully human, as perhaps not three-fifths of a human being, then they would have had evacuation plans. 
they had evacuation plans for people who owned cars and could afford cars and could afford transportation. No plans for people who couldn't afford these things. So in our opinion, we felt that this was a right that was, been vi that was violated, and our opinion in that point was upheld uh, by uh, the Human Rights Committee. But I would say that if you look at what's going on in the Rockefeller drug laws, that, that probably somewhere in that is someone's right to life uh, has been violated by the systems and institutions that are sanctioned by the state. We often hear about the concept of state-sponsored terrorism. But I would say that state-sponsored terrorism is exactly the same thing as the Rockefeller drug laws. And the Rockefeller drug laws are the same thing as state-sponsored terrorism because your state does, does sponsor this, does it not? Hmm. And this is something that terrorizes the people who have been locked up and find their, the, the subs, their substance drained and being drained by the state. Okay, then the, there's another uh, article here, Article uh, 7. The obligation to protect against torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Um, and so uh, that would be from the uh, inadequate medical care. Um, uh, you know, not providing a safe environment when people are incarcerated. The use of ex uh, excessive force, sexual harassment and violence, verbal degradation and abuse. The excessive use of administrative segregation and isolation. And, um, and so on. Uh, uh, Article 9, which has to do the right to liberty and security of person. I don't need to go into that a whole lot. The folk are locked up. What can I say? So they ain't going too far. Article 10, the requirement to treat persons de deprived of their liberty with humanity. There's a requirement to, re to, to treat people who are locked up with humanity, meaning that the main reason that you lock folk up isn't just to lock them up and punish them, but there has to be rehabilitation as a part of that. And we know from the defunding of, uh, of, of reading programs, the defunding of uh, programs where people can begin to, to clean themselves up and get themselves together while in jail, that they now have gone into such a punitive posture that the only thing that these people have to do is sit around and get Get if, they, if they got a mental disease for their disease to get worse, and if they're a criminal to think how, how much deeper they can go into a criminal mindset because they don't have any, any other way to uh, occupy the, their time. There's, uh, there's this one uh, in terms of the right to privacy, and then uh, this one, uh, 19, uh, which has to do with the right to information. So then these are just a few. These are just a few. Of the uh, of the articles uh, that uh, that are within the ICCPR treaty, but if you looked at at CERD and CAT, what I'm saying is is that if you laid that over the experiences of people who are uh, now incarcerated, the experiences of their family. I mean, for instance, there's uh, there's in the ICCPR there's uh, <clears throat> there's uh, articles. I'm kind of skimming here. I'm missing it. That has it. Oh yeah, Article 20. 23 has to do with family protection. Article 24 has to do with children's rights. And Article 26, which is similar to the 14th Amendment, has to do with equal protection of the laws. Now, uh, like I, I, I'm influenced by uh, watching a lot of TV, and so um, I'm going to be like uh, Lieutenant Colombo, and I'm going to just add one more thing. Okay, so, um, so here are some, uh, some opportunities, in my opinion, for, uh, for fighting this, this type of, uh, of an issue and beginning to, uh, to think outside the box. Some of you know that in the People's Institute, we do something that's called a power analysis. And in the People's Institute power analysis, we, ad we identify basically uh, systems and institutions that relate to our community, the poor community, African-American community, any community, as feet of oppression because they're stepping on people and kicking them and, and putting them down. So we're talking about feet of oppression here. So if we have applied our power analysis concept to what we're talking about with the Rockefeller drug laws 
and we begin to look, think of what are the systems and institutions sanctioned by the state that affect people who have been, who have been locked up, what are some of those systems and institutions? Call them out, please. Social services. Social services. How do they get in there in the first place, though? Who, put, who, who's, who encounters them on the street? The police. And then the police take them where? Correct. Prison. Okay, so then you got the penal. But even before uh, and after that goes badly for them, um, uh, the way that they determine that happening Court. is where? Court. Is, so that's the judicial. What other systems and institutions uh, affect their lives? Yeah. Health care system. Education. What? What? Banking. Banks. There's something called prison industries, aren't there? Right? And there's a privatization. So we say corporation. We got to put corporations up here, right? They're getting equipment from somewhere. These tasers are made from by somebody, right? And they're getting all kinds of things and, and training from the U.S. government and so on. So uh, we just there's other ways that we could do this. But I just uh, try to do this uh, as quickly as I can here. So then we call these feet of oppression because they're stepping on people. They're keep they're keeping them down. But as but as you know, as you know, having feet yourself, you know that every, everybody that's got a foot has something in back of their heel called what? An Achilles heel. Each one has an Achilles heel. What is the Achilles heel that we must focus on here? The Achilles heel that we must focus on is the fact that as we look at these systems and institutions, each one of them is getting federal dollars. Each one of these uh, institutions uh, having federal dollars, federal dollars cannot be used to violate people's civil rights, and they can't be used to violate people's human rights. And if you can prove something in a countable or measurable way that this has happened, you can write to someone and you can get them to investigate this. And these people that you write to is something called the OIG, the Office of Inspector General. And each government branch that gives out money anywhere for anything in any place at any time has an Office of Inspector General. How did you know that there was pollution uh, in the in the 911 site? Who did that investigation? The Office of Inspector General. How do we know that uh, that there was uh, there was really torture going on uh, in uh, in Abu Ghraib and really torture going on uh, at uh, at Guantanamo? Once again, the Office of Inspector General. And, and how do we know that the CIA hasn't been acting right lately? It's because of the Office of Inspector General. So each federal branch has an Office of Inspector General. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have done with the Mickle John Civil Liberties Institute, we've been going uh, into the South and all over the country uh, recommending that, um, that everywhere that we see a human rights violation, that has involved each one of these systems and institutions sanctioned by the state is getting federal dollars that violated the rights of people from Hurricane Katrina. We're advocating that in each instance where you can find that, that you write a, a letter to the Office of Inspector General, their, their investigations division, and, uh, and let the chips fly where they may. And uh, allegedly and uh, theoretically, they're supposed to uh, follow up on any complaints that they get. Can you imagine what would happen with respect to not only Hurricane Katrina and all of the agencies that were involved in that, but the Rockefeller drug laws and all the ones that are involved in that, if someone strategically began to apply a civil rights and a human rights framework and counted and measured how the dollars that are going to each one of these instances is being used to mess up somebody's civil rights and human rights. I'm telling you, if our city will had this show, this would be something to make you say, hmm, something we might want to follow up on, right? So that's my first recommendation of how we can think outside the box in terms of fighting for the human rights violations or against those human rights violations. We have a lot of activated students here from Columbia University. Could you all raise 
your, your hand, these activated students that I'm talking about, these are radioactive. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want you, uh, those of you who are local doing this work, to, to look at these people who come to us as a result of uh, the urging, and I don't know if uh, she prodded you or enthusiastically encouraged you, uh, Dr. Cheryl Franks of Columbia University who just came in, so I'm glad that, uh, that you have that influence to, uh, to bring them here because there's all kinds of other things that can be done. We can begin to press presidential candidates on holding these, upholding the civil rights and human rights treaties that we have and then begin to raise questions about what about the ones that we haven't ratified. I don't see anybody raising those questions. You know, the job of the president has to do with treaties. Signing treaties, making treaties, it's the job of Congress to ratify those treaties. Whether it's Obama, Clinton, or any of these other people, hopefully, hopefully you don't get Giuliani up there. Is that the way you say his name? Yeah, well that's the way you say his name. <laughs> but, uh, but at any rate, uh, we need to, uh, because some of us see him uh, for uh, all the people that died while he was the mayor. All the times that people got shot uh, just going for their car keys or their wallet while he was shot, uh, while, while he was shot to, uh, to prominence as the America's mayor. Here we have uh, women who were in their kitchen being shot by police, uh, you know, while he was mayor. Uh, young people on the street shot while he was the mayor. So uh, to me, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name correctly, so I call him Guliani because it seemed like a, de a lot of death follows anything that he's involved with. Um, investigation of prisons has to be uh, accompanied by uh, a human rights framework, was which I've been telling you about. And then letters of fe uh, to elected officials urging repeal, um, you know, on a human rights basis, uh, needs to be done. But then there's something else that needs to be done, and this is my last point. And I'll say this is that. One of the things that I learned last year, hanging around the UN here uh, in New York was, was that in one particular incident that uh, I was listening, because I wanted to see what they would do when they uh, cross-examine a country and what we would have to do as uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, testifying. And what I found was, was that in one instance, I won't call out the name of the country, uh, that I think uh, is, was Norway, <laughs> but uh, they were talking about the uh, human rights violations in Norway. Who knew that they were violating anything over there? I thought they were pretty liberal and cool, but if you're a person that's not white or blonde haired and you're, you're Muslim or you're dark skinned, and particularly as a juvenile, you're going to be racially profiled, you're going to be locked up, you're going to be held incommunicado without uh, any uh, legal representation and all other kind of things. And here's the line of questioning that they ask. They ask, do the police forces in your country know about the human rights of the people that they're locking up according to the dictates of the treaty that you've signed on to? Mm -hmm. And they said, no, <laughs> in their own way. <laughs> uh, do the people who are in the jails know about the uh, requirements of the human rights treaties? Do the, do the educators in your nation know about the human rights of the children that they're teaching? Do the social workers know about the human rights of the people that they're trying to serve? Do judges and do attorneys know about the, so the human rights of the people that they're serving? And they said no on most of those things. Matter of fact, all of those things. And one of the great lies that the United States told when they were being uh, cross-examined was, was that they said that all our educators, all of our media, all of our elected officials know about the human rights requirements. And I think that we need to begin to test that knowledge and test that lie by thinking outside the box and raising the question, what's human rights got to do with it? Thank you. Yes, sir. What is oh, Bush, uh, Condoleezza Rice, and the others, they were saying that the Geneva Conventions did not apply 
in the particular uh, war that they're trying to prosecute right now, the so-called war on terrorism. And what the Supreme Court said was is that in, they, they basically, in the Hamdan uh, decision, which went against Rumfeld, they cited international law. They cited our standing in the international community. So they cited the Geneva Convention and other aspects of international law. So, uh, so that is basic, the basic standing that it has. Also, within the U.S. Constitution, these uh, treaties all have a direct effect on domestic law because treaties, if you look at the second article of the U.S. Constitution, treaties are allegedly supposed to be the supreme law of the land. Exactly. The supreme law of the land. So if the supreme laws of the land are being violated uh, at that level, then that's a violation of something that's intrinsic to the, even the creation of the U.S. Constitution. So while, while there's no, no direct effect many times and sometimes no direct uh, remedies, we see that there's uh, these other ways that, that even as Supreme Court judges are making their decisions on cases here, then they have to uh, begin to look and think outside the box themselves in terms of what other standards that, that, uh, that there are. Thank you.